Have you ever found yourself watching The Lord of the Rings after a long and shitty day? I have. This is because, as Chesterton says, fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. If Frodo can go to Mordor, you can return to your job the next day and survive the week. You can overcome depression, financial adversity, and find joy in life. Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Eva and today I'm going to discuss the fantasy genre. Fantasy comes from the oral tradition. The first fantastic stories were myth, legends, and folk tales. Most of them express universal truths and social anxieties. They were created either to explain natural phenomena or to protect the integrity of a community and the individuals who were part of it. These stories were passed from generation to generation, evolving with the passage of time. For instance, we could find myths of the flood across cultures. Some are even more ancient than the story from the Hebrew Bible. Most of these stories show the gods punishing the corruption of humanity. They intend to exterminate the human race to start anew. The Greeks had Deucalion's story, the Akkadians had the myth of Atrahasis, and the Egyptians had Ra's flood myth. Even in Venezuela, my country, we have a flood story known as the legend of Maria Leonza, in which the anaconda god of water eats a cacatillo princess. After swallowing her up, the serpent grows so much that it causes a flood that kills the Kakatio tribe. And there are many more such stories in other countries. In the case of folktales, the stories convey moral values to teach people to be more judicious and pious, to stay away from vice and danger, to marry and have children. The purpose of these stories was to teach people how to survive by keeping their communities together. When these stories were written down, people began to call them traditional fantasy or fairy tales. Here is where a distinction between traditional fantasy and modern fantasy begins. Some of the most famous fairy tales are those written by Hans Christian Andersen, Charles Perrault and the Green Brothers. Now, the works of the Green Brothers are considered traditional fantasy because they were collectors of stories, not writers. However, they did modify the stories and made them more religious to match the conventions of German society. Their aim was to bring the families together and to help unify the different German states through the language. Six years before the Green's publication, Napoleon had marched into Berlin, so there was a strong need to preserve the German culture as a way to resist the French invasion and the influence of a foreign language. Besides compiling the stories and writing them down, the Greens didn't do anything other generations had not done, because folk tales are constantly evolving. The stories differ from one teller to another, and every version is different. In contrast, hence Christian Andersen created his own stories, so his works are considered modern fantasy. Charles Perrault, on the other hand, is in the middle between traditional and modern fantasy, because some of his stories are versions of folk tales, while others are original creations. Terrell Young explains that, as with folklore or traditional fantasy, modern fantasy is distinguished from other genres by story elements that violate the natural physical laws of our known world, events akin to magic. However, while the original storytellers of folklore are unknown, modern fantasy has known authors. The application of these miraculous elements varies greatly in modern fantasy stories. Talking animals, imaginary worlds, fanciful characters, hobbits, dwarves, giants, magical beings, witches, sorcerers, genies, and so on. However, quality fantasy stories do not employ fantastic elements casually. In fact, fantasy is probably the most difficult genre to write because an author must create a new set of physical laws and then conform unerringly to them. A tiny slip can destroy the credibility of a story. There are different categories of fantasy, such as Animal fantasy, toys and animals imbued with life, tiny humans, peculiar characters and situations, imaginary worlds, magical powers, supernatural tales, 
time warped fantasies, and expanded traditional tales. But one of the most popular categories is high fantasy. According to Madsen, there are six fantasy motifs. A story containing all of them is considered a high fantasy story. Suppose the story contains fantasy's one necessary ingredient magic or the violation of our world's physical laws. In that case, the story is still classified as fantasy literature, as low fantasy, or as some people like to call it, including me, cozy fantasy. Magic is the most important element of fantasy. Young states, Magic is often a part of the setting, explaining otherwise inexplicable events. However, magic itself can be explained or inexplicable in a story. For instance, in some high fantasy stories like Harry Potter, there is a magical system. In contrast, in cozy or low fantasy stories, which are usually fairy tale retellings, Magic tends to be volatile, unpredictable, and whimsical. It doesn't stick to a set of rules. The fantasy setting is either a world we recognize as ours, but governed by a different set of rules, or it is an imaginary place with its own geography and history. Fairy tales take place once upon a time, long, long ago and far, far away, while high fantasy stories can occur in another universe. There are three common world-building methods. Some stories happen entirely in a single imaginary place. In other stories, the characters travel from a primary world to a secondary world through magical means, like a portal. The last method is when a secondary world invades the primary world. Mythology and folktales deal with extreme moral values, so modern fantasy inherited this element from traditional fantasy. It conveys themes of moral duality. Maxine explains that fantasies are about this constant clash of good and evil and how each of these things exists in individuals. This basic theme, of course, gives rise to the conflict in a story. Fantasy readers usually have no trouble aligning characters on the sides of light or dark because fantasy characters typically are not fence-sitters. I don't know if you have heard people complaining about Tolkien's characters being flat. The reason for this is that fairy tales usually have stock or flat characters, and modern fantasy tries to mimic that. The heroes of The Lord of the Rings may have flaws, but they don't have bad qualities. Personally, I prefer characters that have both good and bad qualities, but I don't think that having bad qualities is an essential ingredient to create complex characters. The story's main hero follows the so-called Joseph Campbell's monomyth, which is basically the hero's journey. Joseph Campbell didn't invent this. He studied different ancient stories from around the world and noticed that they all follow certain patterns. Jung simplifies the monomyth into six steps. The hero is called to the adventure by some sort of herald. They are usually reluctant to answer the call. The hero crosses the threshold into the other world, or a place no longer safe and secure. This place is usually unknown or forbidden, or it could even symbolize the underworld. The hero must survive various trials in the new environment. They often face both physical hardship and emotional setbacks. They need to overcome different obstacles and accomplish different tasks. The hero is usually assisted by a protective figure. This is usually a mentor older and wiser than the protagonist. The hero matures, becoming a whole person. This journey is a rite of passage, which means that it symbolizes the transformation from adolescence into adulthood, or from one stage of life to another. Finally, the hero returns. 
they either return home or to a familiar place, realizing that while their world remains the same, a change has occurred within themselves. The characters of fantasy stories come from the author's imagination or from myth and legends. For instance, dragons and fairies are legendary characters, while hobbits are Tolkien's inventions. Human characters in fantasy are also archetypal. We can connect with them because they represent parts of our unconscious. The male hero is usually the Oedipal child. He is immature, has mommy issues and misses his home. The magician is a rational and wise person who always thinks before acting. The witch is the outcast woman who lives on the margins of society and has attained power through her resilience and creativity. We also have the usurper, the ambitious or greedy person who thinks the end justifies the means. The princess in the tower is a young woman who has been sheltered all her life. Jung argues that characters in fantasy stories often employ magical props in accomplishing their heroic or evil deeds. These objects, such as magic cloaks, saws, staff, cauldrons, mirrors, are imbued with power. In addition to all these elements, for a story to be considered high fantasy, its world building must be of a great scale and complexity, and it would likely take the author different books to develop and complete the story. For instance, An Enchantment of Ravens and the Folk of the Air series are some of my favorite books, but I consider them low fantasy books because their magic systems are simple and their world building is small. I actually like low fantasy more than high fantasy because I have a short attention span and I hate keeping tabs on all the elements of a fictional world. I also dislike complex magic systems. With a few exceptions, low fantasy leans more toward fairy tales and folk tales and I tend to like these stories more than high fantasy in which you can find mashups of Greek and Slavic mythology. Akatar, I'm watching you. Overall, these mashups overwhelm me, but I know that some people enjoy them. Before the 20th century, there were many fantasy stories already published, such as Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth, and Lois Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. But it was in the 20th century when there was an explosion of fantasy novels. And this seems to be related to postmodernism. We have Frank Baum's The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, G. M. Barry's Peter Pan, and the most important authors, C. S. Lewis and G. R. R. Tolkien. An incredible emergence of great authors with great stories happens during this century. For those who are unaware, what we know as postmodernism is a period of suspicion and disbelief in science, religion, and culture. Most scholars agree that the postmodern period begins in the 40s with the Second World War. On the one hand, people lost their faith in religion because they went through the First World War and 20 years later, the Second World War happened. They felt that God could no longer protect them. On the other hand, during the Second World War, there was the atomic bomb and science overall was used to cause more evil than good. So people distrusted science because they saw it as a weapon of massive destruction. What is interesting to me is that during this period, high fantasy emerges. And high fantasy is basically a modern epic story. Although these stories draw many elements from mythology, the first authors who begin to write high fantasy are imbuing their stories with religious themes, especially from Christianity. The first most important high fantasy stories that appear were Tolkien's The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and C.S. Lewis' The Chronicles of Narnia. So why am I mentioning this? Why is this important? Because while postmodernism raises discontent and skepticism, fantasy teaches its readers to believe. 
Now, this doesn't mean that Lois and Tolkien are trying to convert you into Catholicism. Their religious themes are buried under many layers of paganism. That being said, their stories remind us that there are core values we need to follow to live in harmony. You don't have to be religious or believe in God to understand why moral codes are important. The other thing is that fantasy stories teach us to believe in ourselves and especially in our potential. It's okay not to like a genre because everyone has different tastes, but some people try to diminish fantasy because it is not realistic. But we need to understand that escapism is the whole point. I love realistic fiction, but this is the book that I pick whenever I'm depressed. Also, fantasy must be credible, even if it's not realistic. Jung believes that good fantasy actually tells the truth about life. It clarifies the human condition and captures the essence of our deepest emotions, dreams, hopes and fears. If fantasy does not do these things, it fails. Fantasy casts light on the realities of life and it does so in interesting, engaging ways, much as a metaphor illustrates truth in general communication. The one thing that fantasy can do that realistic fiction cannot do for many people is to show us the human condition in a meaningful way while also giving us hope. One of the most powerful messages I have learned from fantasy comes from the Lord of the Rings. I am a very short person. I'm only like five feet tall or one meter and a half. I love my height because I look very young. But when you are a short woman, people who don't know you tend to infantilize you. When people are not patronizing me, they underestimate me. So whenever I watch The Lord of the Rings, my heart melts to see the hobbits saving the world. Like you're telling me that these little pastoral creatures that love the comforts of life have the courage to leave their houses to fight against evil. Two of my favorite quotes from Gandalf are Hobbits are amazing creatures. You can learn all there is to know about their ways in a month, and yet, after a hundred years, they can still surprise you. I have found it is the small things, everyday deeds of ordinary folk, that keeps the darkness at bay, simple acts of kindness and love. Like, whoa, you don't need to be a knight in shiny armor to kill the dragon and save the world. You can be a hobbit, you can be whatever you want, and as long as you are kind, you will be making a change. It is extraordinary how fantasy stories that are full of magical elements can show us the value of people and things that we take for granted, that real-life magic exists within ourselves and manifests through acts of kindness. In a world with so much evil, chaos and competition, people feel like they need to be tough to survive. And fantasy reminds us that we are human and that kindness is a fundamental part of our humanity. Even series like Game of Thrones, which don't necessarily contain hopeful messages, can inspire us to be strong by showing us the character's resilience and growth in the face of adversity. To conclude this video, I will leave you with a quote from Cinderella. Be kind, have courage and always believe in a little magic. Once again, thank you so much for watching. If you like fantasy, let me know in the comments what's your favorite fantasy novel. Take care and I'll see you next time. Bye!